Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. Wisdom is the final frontier in gaining true knowledge. Our mission is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Hello, my friend. This is Gramps. Thanks for coming along on our journey to increase wisdom and create a living legacy. Today is day 1,564 of our trek, and it is time for Meditation Monday. Taking time to relax, refocus, and reprioritize our lives is crucial in order to create a living legacy. For you, it may be just a time alone for quiet reflection. You may utilize some sort of structured meditation practices. In my life, meditation includes reading and reflecting on God's Word and in prayer. It is a time to renew my mind, refocus on what is most important, and making sure that I am nurturing my soul, mind, and body. As you come along with me on our trek each Meditation Monday, it is my hope and prayer that you too will experience a time of reflection and renewing of your mind. We are continuing our series this week on Meditation Monday as we focus on mastering Bible study through a series of brief insights from Hebrew scholar Dr. Michael S. Heiser. Our current insights are focusing on the accuracy of interpreting the Bible. Today let's meditate on Bible study, total objectivity, and the weird. Insight number 55. Total objectivity in the Bible interpretation is a myth. Everyone likes to think they're objective. We all want to believe that we can render opinions and judgments wholly divorced from any external influence or personal bias. We don't like the suspicion that we failed to weigh all the possibilities about what a passage might mean before landing somewhere. That would make it seem like our position on some interpretation point is somehow premature, careless, or unfair. We can cherish the thought that we're non-biased, but it's just a delusion. Absolute objectivity about anything we enjoy thinking about or are forced to consider is an impossible standard. We can't hope to jettison altogether every past sight, conversation, or experience from our minds that might nudge our opinions in a particular direction. Even if we're thinking about something or someone with which we've had no prior experience, we have our own presuppositions. We weren't born with those. They are a cumulative result of all of our life's experiences, primarily how we were raised as children. Scholars aren't immune to this struggle either. Dr. Heiser recalls one day in graduate school, his professor lapsed into a mini-lecture on what it meant to be a scholar. One of his points was that real scholars approach the Bible with no biases or presuppositions. Specifically, they bring no prior belief about the Bible to their analysis of the biblical text. Ideas like inspiration and anything else confessional had to be eliminated for real scholarship to occur. While he appreciated the spirit of that advice, we ought not to filter what we see in the text through any theological grid. But Dr. Heiser said he also had to shake his head. The absence of any religious or theological thought about the Bible is impossible, but is a theological statement. The intellectual denial of an idea of inspiration, however defined, will indeed influence how we process the data we glean from a text. The honest thing to do is acknowledge the beliefs that we have. Every Bible student needs to own up to the fact that they might believe something only because the thought was handed down to them. Being up front with that possibility and letting people know that you are trying hard not to filter the Bible through our own beliefs fosters accountability. We shouldn't pretend to be immune from the experiences we've acquired through past study or our interaction with others interested in the Bible. That would just be a facade. Now let's move on to insight number 56. If it's weird, it's important. One of Dr. Heiser's pet peeves with preaching and Bible teaching in the church is the propensity to skip odd or challenging passages in the Bible. This happens for several reasons. Sometimes the person tasked with presenting scripture presumes that only passages truly relevant for folks in the pew are those that have some transparent point of life application. That's usually a byproduct of flawed Bible study, which in turn is often due to laziness. Passages that give us something to say after only the surface reading are good fodder for sermons. At other times, the fear of getting the interpretation wrong encourages pastors or teachers to bypass a passage. Some passages appear to have no current explanation and application. I understand that one, but you shouldn't believe it. The solution involves a combination of the right tools and tenacity. Diligence is the friend, not the enemy of, of the Bible student. It may take weeks, months, or longer to feel like you have handled the passage, but that shouldn't matter. 
Still another reason is the fear of discovery. For some Bible students, digging too deep into a passage might result in surrendering a belief they cherish. In my experience, this is more common than one would suppose. Fear of discovering something that they believe may not be true prompts them to study something else. Lastly, I've met all too many Bible students who don't want to think about specific passages because they are just too weird. Surprisingly, this fear-based response often concerns ideas the Bible affirms that are uncomfortable in our modern world. If the passage turns out to mean what it seems to say, it wouldn't be rational. This fear is inconsistent, especially since some of the things that Christians believe are far from what someone who dismisses the supernatural would consider reasonable. I'm not suggesting that we can always be sure we're interpreting strange or obtruse passages correctly. None of us are omniscient. Instead, I contend that every passage in Scripture merits its own attention. In many instances, the strange and challenging passages are part of a greater idea that is theologically significant. We just don't see it because we don't share the writer's ancient worldview. Dr. Heiser says if it's weird in his experience, it's important. There's a purpose for every passage in the Bible, and our job is to discover what it is. So let's wrap up with Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And that's a wrap for today's meditation. Next week we will continue our trek on Meditation Monday as we take time to reflect on what is most important in creating our living legacy. Thank you for joining me for this trek that we call life. Encourage your friends and family to join us and to come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. If you'd like to listen to any of the past 1,563 daily treks or read the daily journals, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Wisdom Trek on your favorite podcast player so that each day will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Track Podcast and Journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you tomorrow.